Hi, welcome to the pastor's desk. I've had a question that has been posed to me in recent days on a number of occasions and I thought we would do well to spend a little time in God's Word answering that question. It is the question that has to do with anointing with oil. So what I want to do today is I want to give us a, a, a little flyby of James chapter 5 where the Bible speaks of calling for the elders of the church and then bringing them in and having them anoint with oil. James chapter 5 really has a lot to say to us uh, about prayer in its reality, in its essence. So let me dive in here and I'll show you a context and maybe it'll help you understand exactly what it means to call for the elders of the church. James chapter 5 begins with words of rebuke to the rich who had been exploiting the poor. And when you look at this, you're seeing James just dressing down these rich people who had workers, laborers, and it sounds very clearly to be an instance of defraudment where they had not paid uh, their wages to those who were under their um, employ. And so when he turns the corner, and this is where we begin to see how the context affects everything, he gives two imperatives to those poor, to those who were exploited, to those who uh, had cried out to God for some kind of justice in this situation. Two imperatives. The first one is, Be ye patient therefore, brethren. It almost sounds like it doesn't fit the context, but when you realize he now turns from the uh, exploiters and turns to the exploited. And he says, what you're going to need, because you can't fix that person's heart who's exploiting you, he says, you must be patient. It's an imperative. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Now he's telling those exploited ones, those humble, willing servants of God who are being defrauded, he's saying you're going to have to have patience in such cases. Because the natural reaction is to lash out, to become indignant and frustrated. In fact, in verse 9 he says, grudge not one against another, because there's that sense uh, where bitterness can come to play here. But he says, be patient, and he talks about the husbandman. Now, for we who are children of God, the husbandman is Christ. We are the field, and he's drawing out of us through a, the sanctification process that which he desires. He says, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit, and uh, God's looking for something in you and me, and sometimes he allows circumstances, and he's going to reference Job, and and getting the testimony out of Job has been a, a transgenerational blessing for all of us because he's gone through the crucible and come out blessed. But what we see is he's saying, you know, God is in control and he's looking for fruit in our lives and we need to have patience because God takes no pleasure in our distress and it says, the husband hath long patience for it. So God would have us be patient, knowing that He is looking for something in us. Verse 8 says, Be ye also patient. Just like the husbandman, he said it once, be patient. Now he says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He says, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Now that word literally has the idea of self-condemnation, bringing upon ourselves that feeling of oppressive grief that comes. Man, we lash out, we feel terrible about it. He says, lest you be condemned, behold the judge standeth at the door. God is just over on the other side. He, who is the God of the whole earth, will do right, trust him in your narrow straits that you find yourself. He says, don't grudge. Now, this is a condition of being exploited by an employer or a, a slave owner in their days, as it were, or somebody who's brought somebody in to work for them. That could be happening in your world. 
But it also could be you're aggravated with your husband or your wife. You're frustrated. They're not understanding your, your, your illnesses, your sicknesses, your needs. And so he would say the same thing to you. If you're being defrauded, be patient. Uh, don't grudge that other person because you can bring self-condemnation. Now, that's very important because this is going to dovetail into that anointing with oil thing. But he says, grudge not. Don't fall into bitterness. Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard even of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful. God will bless us back. It is Paul who makes it clear in 2 Corinthians that our light affliction, which endureth but for a moment, works for us a far greater weight of glory. And so what I want to suggest to us to try to draw down on here is the context. He says, be patient, grudge not, look at those prophets. They suffered affliction too. I know in this context you're being defrauded by that that landowner, or in our case, it may be a sickness, we're aggravated with the doctors, we're aggravated with the companies that take care of our medicines, and we're aggravated with our uh, family who do not understand. And so he says, don't fall into that grudge. Just look at the example of those who have gone before. Verse 12 says, But above all, my brethren, swear not by heaven or by earth, neither by any oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Again, and the imperative of being patient, coupled with the imperative of not to grudge, and now what we're seeing is the imperative of being careful not to get into that, that tendency we have to bargain with God. I had a dear lady once who actually had a son who had gotten into some real deep trouble, and it looked like he was going to go to prison. And she made a vow to God in the midst of that crisis in her life. And when she did that, what ended up happening was she told God, God, I will, I will, not, I will not miss church if you'll just get my son out of this, out of this pickle he's in. And, and God, of course, answered that. And this dear lady was not a very uh, disciplined gal. She only was very spotty at best in her in her church attendance, but she thought, this is the chip I've got, I'm going to play it. And she said, God, I won't miss. And she was good for a little while, but not long after the son got released, she stumbled back into old habits of being very spotty. And for there came a point where I didn't see her for a while. And in, upon inquiry, I found out she was in one of those uh, floors at the hospital for those who were mentally disturbed. And I went and saw her, and I found out what had happened and I said, oh, dear sister, I said, you know, your husband's not a believer. And the Bible says that when a woman makes a vow, if her husband hears of it, he can release her of that vow. And since your husband isn't one to come alongside, I'm going to assume a spiritual headship for you, and I'm going to release you from that vow because you, wouldn't, uh, you weren't capable of being able to keep that vow. As we talked that day, she got to the point where she could breathe, and we were literally singing some of the songs of Zion before I left her there that day. And in two days, she was released from that mental ward and she was good again. You see, vowing can be very troubling. Ecclesiastes says it's better not to vow, because if you vow and defer to pay, uh, God will not take that as a light issue. So we need to be careful. So he's saying that. You're in a corner. You want to make a vow. Don't make a vow. Bible says, vow not, don't, don't make any kind of oath. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And then he moves into this next section because this is what's happening. He says this in verse 13, is any among you afflicted? The word is kakapathia. What you might recognize here is the pathia because it's the idea of sympathy, empathy. It means to feel, to feel with uh, or to feel for uh, empathy, sympathy, pathia means that feeling, and kakos is the Greek word that means evil. If you have any of this kind of affliction, uh, this internal uh, kakapathia, this fighting and this frustrating, the Bible says we are to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. That's another use of the word uh, kakapathia. 
uh, Paul was talking to Timothy there. So understand that as you consider all of these things that could frustrate you, make you grudge, make you lose your patience, make you make an oath, he says, if you've got cacopathia, if you've got hardness, he says, if any of you is afflicted, let him pray. Now our problem is, is that prayer is akin to becoming naked before God. We don't want to do that. Typically, we stay very surface. But when things are really hard and it's getting at us and the world's getting on us and it's like, you know, it's like, ick. We're afflicted and we're struggling. The Bible says if you're afflicted, the answer is not impatience and lashing out, grudging and bitterness. It's not being somebody who makes oaths and bargains with God. What you need to do when you're in the crucible of whatever circumstance you find yourself, he says, pray. Then he says, is any merry, let him sing psalms. <laughs> you got to understand, this is huge because they don't seem to go together. Uh, let him pray if you're afflicted. How did the merry guy get into the mix? If any of you is merry, it says, let him sing songs or psalms. And the, the, the context of it is, is if you pray, God lifts your burden. The word literally means to be cheered up. Because <laughs> if we're in the closet with God, we're working it out. We're like Job of old. We may not know why it is we're being defrauded. Why it is somebody we care about isn't caring about us. Why it is the affliction's not lifted. But when we get in God's presence and say with Job, the Lord gives... Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. And go beyond that and say with Job again, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And we hold on to God with all we are, no matter what the circumstances. Now, if we can get that kind of purchase for our faith, that kind of relief that comes from resignation, letting ourselves just lay back in God's hands and say whatever you want, like Mary of old, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. We'll find that lifting. The Greek word is euthamapo. He says, if you will become less passionate about your problem and more passionate in a good way, you is good, eulogy, you is good, euthamos, be more passionate about him, you might just find yourself able to sing. He says, is any merry? Meaning, you got that in the closet, let him sing psalms. And then he says, is any among you uh, sick? To be feeble. It's the word asthaneo, and it has the idea of having no strength and can mean diseased. Now you say, oh, there it is, I'm sick. That's my problem, I'm sick. Listen, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, when those folks were taking the Lord's Supper, because they were elbowing each other out of the way and being wanting to be preferred in their feast there. He said, judge yourselves, do this thing decently and in order. He says, because you've dissembled at the Lord's Supper. He said, therefore many are sick among you and many sleep. You see, sometimes if we won't judge ourselves, God will have to discipline. And so I want to just throw that out there to recognize that sometimes the afflictions we're having result from maybe our grudging. The Bible talks about bitterness, a root of bitterness, and by it many be defiled, taking the lame uh, limb that's out of joint and straightening it back into its, into its place. See, this is why we get from there to calling the elders. He says, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Is any money, anyone without any strength? And if you take the contact, if you're cacopathia, and you pray, and you too weak to get anywhere with that, so you can't get to the Mary, because that's two places you can go. You try to pray, you got nothing. So that ends up saying, I'm sick, I'm weak, I got nothing. But you're stronger in the Lord, you've got some discernment, you've got chapters and verses, and then you take this way, you get Mary, you get euthamos. Now, the Bible says then, if you're the one who took that other road and you have no strength, he says, is any among you sick? let him call for the elders of the church. Now, 
First thing to notice here is this is a plurality of elders because what you're doing now is you're in this crucible. You figure you don't believe belong there, and so you now call the elders, not elder, because you know it's easy sometimes for a pastor to try to accommodate, try to encourage. But when you take a couple, three guys together and you bring them in to look at your situation, you may find <laughs> that one of them is going to say, "No, man." She or he's got this going on in his life. Listen, we and they will investigate and they'll talk and they'll ask you questions about your circumstances. And many times they will keep each other honest, if you will. Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. And this is very important because this was a time on the cusp of the miraculous healings of the early New Testament apostles and now that they're coming out of that time where God was bearing witness to their ministry with signs and wonders as it says in Hebrews God was himself was bearing witness of those things because the things were changing so rapidly now you have elders who are just working and walking by faith and they themselves need to be admonished pray for this person in my ministry sometimes I'm like I, I don't know how to pray for this person or that I mean sure I can pray God please help them heal them but sometimes in the back of my mind I don't know what God is up to and I don't want to find myself praying against God and so the elders keep each other straight on this so you're calling for the elders you're in a crucible you don't know what you can't get any lift you can't get any relief and the Bible says, call for the elders and let them pray, anointing him with oil. Now here we are at that, that, that centerpiece, anointing. There are two words in the Greek for anointing. There's the Greek word kreo, which we understand Jesus is the Christ, which means the anointed one. And then there's the Greek word alepho, and that is the word for basically just putting a little bit of uh, hair, uh, oil on your head. You know, the Bible used that word when it says, when you fast, do not appear to men to fast, but anoint your head with oil, and he who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is talking about helping this person get back up on their feet. Get this person back into a condition where they have a little more confidence. They don't have maybe chapter and verse to get past their affliction, and the faith measure, uh, the faith quotient in their life is minimal. And so he says, call for the elders, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, helping him get back up on his feet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're going in the name of the Lord, they're keeping each other honest, they're in, in, involving themselves in these people's lives, and they're helping them get out of the thicket, like many sheep get in. And the Bible says in the prayer of faith, shall save the sick. And that means basically to bring them up, deliver them out of that pickle. You know, the Bible talks about receiving the grafted word, which is able to save your souls. And he's talking to Christians in James when he talks about that. And he's talking about we need to uh, keep ourselves close enough to the Savior so we're not in a lot of conflict. So he says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins... See, there's a couple reasons he might be in this crucible. One is he doesn't know how much God loves him and that God is sovereign and providential and even in this thing there could be some good so he can't find lift so they might bring light there. But if he sinned, the Bible says, if any have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. And yes, sometimes a healing can come from getting clarity. You know, if you go on in, an un, uh, in a bound up condition, you might find yourself having migraines, you might find yourself having ulcers, you might find yourself getting sick because you're wearing yourself down, you can't sleep, and you're at maybe bitterness, right? We know bitterness, it can create hypertension, giving way to a chronic blood pressure problem. Beloved, that's life. We need to understand what God can do, and what God can do is He can forgive. And by the encouragement of a pastor, of elders, who've come together and helped you work through these things, in the light, not just telling you what you want to hear, but being honest, being clear, helping you get clear, that is the anointing with oil. Helping you get back up, get your hair combed, get your clothes back on, get out of those pajamas, get out of that bed, because God shows you he has purpose in all things. Now it's interesting here that the admonition is to the pastors, 
because he reminds them, he says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. He says, let the elders pray. In fact, he goes on to say that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much in verse 16. It's almost as if he has to tell the person to pray, but tell the pastors to pray, because like I said, sometimes it's hard for us to know how to pray. And we are a little bit reluctant to go in there and try to talk to God about something without any resource, without any understanding of what we're supposed to really ask for. No, you, got, you get the clarity as a pastor, and with that clarity, you pray. If there's sin, you help them see that, and you bring that believer along and show them, God can forgive even that. Sometimes people did something really bad, and they're just kind of holding their hands close over that wound, and they won't let it be seen so it can be healed, but they're now in a crucible, and they're willing to ask you, and you tell them, God can forgive that. You need to know that. God can forgive that. He loves. He understands. You've not shocked him. The one who's omniscient has never been surprised by our stumbles. We're like going into a store. We're looking at something on the shelf. We see it. We pick it up. It's got a broke, broken piece on it. We put it back. God came in. He saw us and we were broken and he bought us anyway. And so I suggest to you when he talks about a fervent righteous man and all that, that prayer avails much. He's telling the preachers, pray. You guys know better. Don't not pray, but don't pray in contradiction to God's will. That's why you need to interact with that person. He illustrates it by saying Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. You know, he was angry at Ahab. He hated the fact that that man was a wicked king listening to a wicked queen. and It was a bad day. But he prayed. And he prayed according, listen, to God's will. The Bible says Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. So he was angry, but he didn't grudge. What he did was he dove in the word that he had. And you know what he found? He found that when the people of God were not doing what God told them to do, when they were being disobedient and dissembling, he found that it said he would make the heavens brass. Remember that? And so he prayed according to God's word. And that's where fervent effectual prayer comes from. You gain a promise that is legitimately applied and you apply it to that person's life. And he says, Elijah prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not by the space of three years, six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain. Brethren, 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 not just those people who are in the crucible, but all of us. If any do err, from the truth, and one convert him. You see, he's talking to the people who are helping these folks find forgiveness. So he's gone beyond now, just the person in the crucible. And if you're in the crucible, it's for you too. God would have us all grow up into the grace, not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, not thinking it's prosperity theology, not thinking that God heals everyone. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, prayed three times that God would remove it, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So understand, there may be purpose here. And we're all supposed to grow up. Get the promises, get the footing, get the stability. And the Bible says you, if you're an elder, or you if you're somebody who's a mentor in Christ to somebody, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Remember what I said about 1 Corinthians 11, shall save a soul from death. 1 John chapter 5 says, there is sin not unto death. Pray for that person. He said, but the person who sinned is sin unto death. I say not that you should pray for him. 1 Corinthians 11, many are sick and many sleep, literally died. Now we need to take seriously God's word. And sometimes there's sin, sometimes there's just an unclarity, a lack of scripture in our hearts to fight back with whatever we're confronting. These people were confronting the defraudment of the landowners, of the rich. They were being defrauded and they therefore either grudged, lashed out in impatience, made rash vows to God. But in the end, when you can't find purchase for yourself, bring in some brothers who know Christ. 
not one person because that, that intense you know, examination might require a couple people being accountable to be honest. If you can't get purchase, then get a couple people around you and ask them to pray for you. And they'll help you get your hair back in order, get your clothes back in order, get back to being a witness, get back to being a blessing. This is an issue. People everywhere ask this throughout the world. Really, they look at the scriptures, they're in a crucible, they don't know what to do about it. I hope this helps. The context gives us the understanding that what God would have you and me do is be those who walk in the light. And even as you do that, May God bless you with strength, listen, with merriment, euthamos, a passion for Christ more than a passion for our own vindication, because God takes the works that we have to do in the day to day and He uses them, whether it's through crucibles and breaking the alabaster box and letting the fragrance come out, or whether it's through the healing and the raising up, God uses all that for His glory. And I hope you can get your mind around that. As I close, I just want to remind you of something, you know. Jehoshaphat was a man in the Old Testament who had a great gathering of people coming against him that he could not in any foreseeable way overcome. He fell on his face before God and he said, God, I, I got nothing. I got nothing. And when God brought him a priest who he brought the word of the Lord through, he brought this priest and the priest said, you're not going to have to fight. God's got this because you've poured out your heart and been totally uh, transparent with him. You cast your hope on him. He is going to honor that for you and you're not going to have to fight. What you're going to do is you're going to see the victory. Ah, well, Jehoshaphat got lit up, didn't he? He got so lit up because he got through prayer and he got clarity from Scripture, literally from revelation from God, and he took that and he got merriment. What did he do? He told all of his people, come near, God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And he had arranged everyone not to get swords, but to tune up their songs. And as God began to bring a defeat against three armies fighting among themselves, wiping each other out, he literally marched down into that valley singing. <laughs> singing. Praise ye the Lord for his mercy, his hesed love endures forever and ever. Beloved God, God's mercy endures. He loves you. He's for you. And if you don't have chapter and verse or scripture or clarity enough through the, the, the maybe limited resources, maybe you're young in the Lord, just don't know a lot of Bible, get somebody who does. Draw them near say, I don't know what I've done. I've tried. I'm trying to figure it out. Maybe impatience. Maybe grudging bitterness. Maybe you made a vow. There's a couple places to start. But if you can't find anything else, you need to go back to Job and realize sometimes God's got something up his sleeve we don't know anything about, and we need to resolve to let ourselves be in his hands, like Mary did, saying, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Well, I hope this has helped you, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Maybe you can share with somebody else when they're in the crucible, because people are going to ask, What do I do with this anointing with oil thing? Therefore, I put this together. And hopefully folks will be able to pick up on it and go to their knees and more deliberately. If you're in the crucible, pray. If you're an elder called to uh, come in and anoint somebody, explain these things, let them watch this, and then tell them you'll be glad to come. Help them figure out things that they're going through. And, and you'll pray a fervent, effectual prayer upon investigation. That'll be the way God, I think, would have us do. Well, God bless you. And thanks for joining me at the pastor's desk. There's, there are those issues sometimes we must deal with, and here's one of them that I think needed some addressing. Well, also, I just want to say we're on sermonaudio.com under Faith Baptist One, and you can look for us there. You can download our podcasts. We believe in teaching God's Word verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So maybe what you've heard here will help you get into that as well. God bless.